I guess we're waiting on our bell ringer. Yeah. That bell has been in this building since 1958. That bell right there. All right. Good to see everybody. Um, looks like we're a little thin tonight, but uh, maybe more will be coming in for long. Um, want to remember everyone on our sick list. Uh, of course, Amos Dean is still in Thomas. Uh, he may go home tomorrow. Um, still has infection from his gallbladder, so hopefully they will get that cleared up and he can go home. Uh, remember Arnold Mungy, Audrey Peets, Sue Wheeler. Sue had a back x-ray yesterday. She has done something. Um, I don't know whether it's uh, she's pulled a muscle or she's cracked a rib or something. Uh, but she's been this way for four weeks now. Thought it'd get better, so. And heard anything from the doctor yet, so y'all keep her in your prayers. Also, Lucille Watkins, uh, Rhonda Burtnett, uh, Edna Wyatt, Sherry Dean, Bonnie Wright, uh, Vaughn and Marshall Underwood, Nancy Marshall, Jerry and Della Hill, Geraldine Yeager, Marilyn Galloway. She's out of COVID jail. So uh, we can, I, do we want to take you off or leave you on or what? Okay, we just ask you out. So, um, Elena Smith, uh, she had surgery yesterday. This is uh, Dannon's mother-in-law. Also Colleen Corrado, uh, Connie Stacy, Jill Shirley, Danny Mills, Chris Elliott. Juanita Chanel, Juanita Griffin, Jerry Griffin, Aurelia Rogers, Maria Martin, Francis Turner, Teresa Anderson, Alan Woodall, and Justin Rohde. So, yes, this is Bo's brother. This is uh, Justin, uh, he's got uh, a lot of problems, and uh, one of them is anxiety. I do know that. So um, he's just going through a rough patch right now. Bo asks if we remember him in our prayers. So um, anybody else? And he, he is the one that was attacked by the pit bulls, tore his clothes off of him. I, I haven't heard. Um, I, I don't know. She had uh, breast cancer, and I, I don't know what kind of surgery this was. I'm just assuming that it was uh, related to that. So keep, uh, keep them in your prayers. Maybe we can get some clarification on that. Uh, Dana was here Sunday night, but she left early. So things are pretty, pretty tough for her, I'm sure. So keep her in your prayers. Anybody else? Yeah, hey, Fran. So you don't know if he is or he is, and he's just not telling you. been over see I've been to uh, Russia and it's a different world so keep Nate in your prayers okay okay all right well we'll certainly uh, be mindful of that anybody else 
She said that Nate, her son, is may go to the Ukraine tomorrow on a mission trip with one other fellow. They're meeting with the elders. Fran doesn't want him to go. And uh, not just Fran, that's right. The entire family, they may tie him up, whatever. He may be missing for a couple of days. But you better have your passport ready. You better have your visa ready. You better have extra money because when you go through those uh, lines at the airport in different countries, it's a hundred dollar bill. So, yeah. Anyway, that's 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 the world. That's the way it is. So, anybody else? All right, and I'll mention this, we're updating the church directory. Thank you. Updating the church directory, and if you've got, if your information is not correct, then let me know. We, all, we like to get numbers backwards and put in the wrong address and birth date. So, um, and I blame it on the computer because you can save it, and then when you go back, it seems like it has not saved it or saved something different than what you put in there. Or you can't find your file. But anyway, that's, my, that's what I'm thinking. Anybody else? Well, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your love and mercy and for your grace. And Father, we ask thee at this time to bless all of those who are going through difficulties, through health issues, and who've lost loved ones. We especially pray for Amos as he is in the hospital. Pray that, Father, that uh, he can uh, be well enough to come home and be back among his family again. Father, we pray for Alina as she is undergoing surgery uh, yesterday. We pray for her health also. Also, Dannon, we ask you to bless her as she is coping with the loss of James and Father we pray we can be that support for her and she can find comfort. Also Father we pray for Nate as uh, the decisions are being made. We pray for his safety as he travels and bless him Father and give him a safe return home. Bless his family and watch over us. Father bless us in our Bible study this hour. All these blessings and favors we ask in Jesus name. Amen. All right, we're in the book of Revelation, and we've been here, chapter 19 is where we are, chapter 19, the first part of chapter 19, is that here is praise and exaltation of God who has rendered justice, who has destroyed the beast, destroyed the, uh, those that uh, would persecute the saints, you remember Back over in chapter 6 and 7, where actually 7, where the saints are under the altar, they are crying, How long, how long? Uh, they have been beheaded, meaning they have been martyred and uh, tremendously suffered through this time. So we have seen the, the, seen God as, uh, brings judgment upon. Uh, the just the dragon and upon the beast and the second beast, uh, meaning that here is his he has uh, kept his promise and that the Christians are are now reigning. Although they are dead, although they have lost, they have not lost their eternal life. Uh, remember in Revelation two verse ten, where the Lord said Himself. Be faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He, in that same passage, he tells them they're going through tribulation for 10 days. Now remember, 10 days is a figurative number. It means a, a short period of time or a period of time in which they will, will undergo this horrendous persecution. At the time this book was written, somewhere around 95 to 100 AD, the emperor that was in charge was Domitian. 
he was the son of Vespasian, the second son of Vespasian. Vespasian was the uh, general who surrounded Jerusalem in AD 70 along with Titus, his son. Uh, Nero is murdered or commits suicide. What history says two different things. There are two or three other emperors that come to power within a two-year period, but in 68 AD, uh, word gets back to Vespasian that he is the emperor. So he goes back to Rome, leaves Titus there at Jerusalem, and then as he becomes emperor, he tells Titus or sends word to Titus to destroy Jerusalem. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem in the days of the Romans play a major role in Christianity. Number one, it was prophesied by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. He tells them, he says, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel. At Daniel, 600 years before Christ, and uh, prophesies that uh, that this uh, beast will come in and there is this destruction, the abomination of desolation. And uh, Daniel prophesies concerning the destruction of Jerusalem 550 years before it happens. And so the Christians are listening to the words of Jesus when the in Matthew chapter 24, when they talk about, they hear wars and rumors of wars, the Roman army is marching out and coming down in the uh, in uh, Palestine area. You've got Jerusalem here. Um, you've got the Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. They're marching down. The Christians get out of uh, Jerusalem. When, In fact, when they surrounded this two years before, it was destroyed, the Christians left. And he tells them, if you're on the housetop, don't come down. In other words, go from the top to the top and then go off the wall and get out of town. Pray that your flight is not in the winter because when you're, it's in the winter, certain times of the day, the gates are going to be cold, closed. It's going to be cold. Pray that uh, women are not pregnant because it's going to slow them down as the Romans come in to get away. And it was a massacre in AD 70. It was a massacre in Jerusalem. And not a single Christian died in that destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And it was all because of Daniel's prophecy and the Lord's warning. Jesus warning them in Matthew 24. But Vespasian, uh, Domitian, uh, or rather Vespasian, he rules probably somewhere between 15 years, somewhere between 12 to 15 years. His son Titus then takes the throne. Titus uh, was kind of, a, he was not the, the persecutor uh, as his father was and certainly not the persecutor as his brother was. But there was kind of a lull in persecution and in, in the attack of Christians. But when Titus uh, was removed, or uh, I don't know whether he died or whether he, he was removed, but, but Domitian then comes in. This is his brother, his younger brother. And when he comes in, he vows to bring all of the Roman Empire all of the subjects of Rome, bring them into allegiance with Rome. And when he, he made that vow, he was actually fulfilling what his daddy had determined to do because Rome was coming apart at the seams. Uh, you had Christians who would not bow to the, to, the, um, to the gods of the Romans, to the Latin gods or... Uh, you had the Greek gods, you had the Roman gods, and the Christians didn't bow to them. Of course, uh, they were blamed, Christians were blamed for the catastrophes that came. If there was a fire, if there was a tornado, if there was a, a storm that came in, 
The Christians were blamed because they didn't worship the idols, the gods that protected them. And of course, they were idols. But anyway, Domitian decides that he would be called Lord God Almighty. And he set up these images of himself in all of the providences of Rome. There's about uh, um, the province of Rome. Uh, there's about 10 province, provinces, is that how you pronounce that? 10 of those in those regions. He set them up and, and, and they were required to bow to them, uh, to kiss the, the image. And if they did that, they would have, first of all, they'd have peace. Secondly, they would uh, be able to buy and sell. Uh, Rome would give a certificate to, to buy and sell. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Romans would allow them to worship other gods. Uh, they didn't, uh, the emperor worship was not the only uh, idol that they worshiped, but the Christians would not bow to the image of Rome. And so they became a target, and, and Rome went after them. And uh, we went after them with a heavy hand. That is what Revelation is about. And so we come to chapter 19, and there is this, this great uh, celebration of how that God uh, has brought uh, the enemy down, that Babylon has fallen. And remember, Babylon is, a, is symb symbolic of, um, of wickedness, Symbolic of paganism, of idolatry, is symbolism of, of just all kinds of wickedness. And so Rome is the only one that fits this description at this time. Babylon itself has been destroyed uh, by the Persians, and that was, has been over uh, six or seven hundred years before that, actually about five hundred years. Um, Egypt had already fallen. It was a world power in the days of Pharaoh when Moses went in. The Assyrians became very powerful right before Babylon came to, uh, to power. But Babylon quickly uh, snuffed out the Assyrians. You remember Jonah as he goes into the city of Nineveh. And what Jonah does is say, yet 40 days God is going to overthrow this. And that period, time period, there was a lull of, of uh, evil and the king actually turned to God and, and, and history bears this out, uh, the type of king. But after this king died uh, and after they had repented, then they come back to this concept of, of bringing fear to, to those people in the world. And of course, uh, when you walked into the city of Nineveh, there were two, two statues, uh, bodies of, of a lion, but the head of a terrible looking beast. And it was to bring intimidation to them. And so um, the Ninevites were very cruel. Uh, they used fear to capture a city. Uh, they often would surround the city and they would send a messenger to the wall and, and there's the king on the wall and there's the people of, of the city waiting and, and what the Assyrians would do is says, if you will send out uh, 10 men, you'll send out 10 of your strongest men, we will let the city survive. But what we're going to do, are we going to kill those 10 men in front of you. We're going to lay them out here. We're going to kill them. And, and it, what it did was bring fear to them. And so there was just total chaos inside that city because somebody, I'm not going out there. You going? No, I'm not going out there. So the point was that here they used intimidation. Babylon came in and destroyed Nineveh and destroyed the Assyrians. And that is what the book of Nahum is all about. And then, of course, the Persians come in and destroy the Babylonians because they also were wicked. And so then you had the Greeks. Um, you had um, Alexander the Great who came in and from the west to the east. Uh, he was like lightning. Daniel prophesies of, 
of Alexander the Great as, the, as he moves quickly across the land. And of course, what Alexander does, he takes over the, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire and he brings a world language to, to everyone. And then, of course, the Romans rise up uh, while the Greeks are, when Alexander the Great dies, uh, his, his world kingdom is divided into four parts. Uh, the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, um, there's two others, I can't remember the name, but Chrysandas, and one other. But anyway, uh, because of that division, then Rome is able to move in. And Rome begins to build, and he is, Rome is this fourth beast in Daniel 2. And it's the uh, fourth beast in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 8, and it's a terrible beast. It is, it is not like the others. It, this is a very terrible beast. And so as Domitian takes, takes rule at this time, as it is written here, Domitian is one of the worst emperors uh, concerning Christianity, and of course, um, he he really destroys or tries to destroy Christianity, but it doesn't work because what happens is that people are willing to die for their faith. But when when Domitian came in to persecute these Christians, like pouring water on a grease fire, I mean the Christians scattered, and when they did, they took the gospel with them. The Jews pushed Christianity out of Jerusalem. And then when they pushed them out of Jerusalem into the, the Roman world, then Rome then took over in the persecution and pushed them uh, in other places of the world. And that's how the, the, uh, the drive of, the Christ, of Christianity went through the world. And so here at this time, Domitian has made havoc of the church he has martyred thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians. And now in chapter 19, they are glorifying God because Rome is now fallen. Now re remember, this is prof uh, prophetic. It's, uh, prophecy is most of the time written in past tense. And it's because that it's already has happened in the mind of God. So you, you've got this prophecy here in Roman uh, Revelation chapter 19, and I'm just going to read a few verses here, where he says, And after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belongs to the Lord our God. They have been crying out to God in chapter 7, When will you avenge us? And so what happens is now they, the Bible, the announcement that they have fallen and now they're glorifying God. All of heaven is rejoicing. All of the saints who have lost their lives, who have been beheaded, who have died, who have been martyred, they are rejoicing because Babylon or Rome is fallen. Now, when it was written, it had not fallen, but it was as, as though it had already had. Rome does not have that death grip on Christianity anymore. It does not have that death, death grip on the world because the kings had to dance to the music of the Romans and of, of Domitian. And now all of this is certainly fallen. They continue their praise, verse 2, for true uh, and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his saints shed by her. There's a passage there in Psalm. I think it is Psalm 58, verse 10. If someone has that, would turn that there and read that for us. Psalm 58, verse 10. I believe that's the passage I want. So, 
So who is going to wash their feet in the wicked, in the blood of the wicked? It's the Lord. When he goes through and he stamps out the wicked, his feet's covered in blood because he has wiped them out. That is a prophecy, a prophetic uh, passage uh, in the book of Psalms talking about the righteous judgment of God. All right, so now we go back over to Revelation chapter 19. And then we talked about uh, how that there was that the, the bride was made ready, uh, the bridegroom was made ready, and the bride were made ready for the marriage. Remember, remember this, that when we talk about the marriage of the church and of Christ, we're talking about the church in her final glory, in her purification, as she has arrayed in white, purity, righteousness. It is, the, it is after judgment is what he's talking about because you know that not everybody in the church is righteous. They don't live a righteous life. So the judgment has happened. God has judged the world. The righteous are now and the union for Christ to be is, uh, is ready uh, for the marriage. Christ takes a bride, a pure bride, well, he is the judge, but he's also the bridegroom. And so this is the illustration of how that the church belongs to Christ and the union is how important that it is. And he is the judge. That's what Brother Sewell said, and that's so correct. All right, so now let's go on down to uh, verse number 11. And now I saw uh, heaven opened, and behold, a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except him. All right? So in chapter 6, beginning in chapter 6, we also see a rider on a white horse. This is not Christ. In chapter 6, it is not Christ. It is Rome. Rome goes out and there is victory. He's got a bow in his hand and he's going out and he is conquering the nations. He, Rome is bringing the world under its control. He is conquering them all. But after, after the white horse, what is the next horse we see? What color horse in chapter 6? I didn't hear you. A red horse. What's red symbolic of? Bloodshed. So in war, there's victory in war, but the result of it is bloodshed, right? And then there is a black horse. And that is, that is famine. That is disease. And then there is the pale horse, which is death. So you have a white horse, victory. Red horse, bloodshed in war. The, the, what follows bloodshed and in war is the black horse is disease and famine and pestilence. And then what follows disease and pestilence and sickness is death. But we don't see that in chapter 19. We see a rider. He is on a white horse. And notice what it says in this, in this passage he says, who sat on him was called faithful and true. Nobody in Rome is called faithful and true. In chapter 1, there it is talking about the righteousness, the faithfulness of Christ. He's true in judgment and in righteousness. None of the emperors of Rome were righteous or just in their, in their ruling. This is pertaining to Christ. And notice what it says in this particular passage. And he judges and makes war. Who is he making war to? We've already read that they're rejoicing in the first part of 19. So he's making war upon whom? Rome. And upon the persecutors of, of, of Christians. Upon those people who are, uh, who are out to, to wipe out Christianity. Uh, Domitian and the uh, Concilia and those who set up these idol worships. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. All right, his eyes are a flame of fire. We already see that in chapter 1. What does this mean? His righteousness, his judgment is pure and righteous. And let me tell you something. Those that are wicked, those that are evil, those that have brought destruction upon God's people are going to suffer the wrath of the lamb, of the writer here. And so his, his eyes are like a flame. He pierces the night. He sees all evil. He knows who is, who is destroying uh, Christians who are fighting and killing, murdering Christians. And on his head were many crowns. How many crowns were on the beast in chapter 13? How many crowns? Ten. Ten crowns. How many crowns are on Christ? Many. Many. More than ten. This is diadem. This is the word that is used for a ruler, for a king. And here is in chapter 6, it is Rome. And chapter 13, the beast, which is also a pit portrait of Rome, has ten uh, crowns. Ten is an earthly number. It's not a spiritual number. And it is a, a limited number. Although it's a high number, it's limited. But here is, his, is the righteous, the true and righteous king. And he has many crowns. He has more crowns than the, than the beast. He has more crowns than those individuals who, um, who are, were of Rome. Yeah, entirely victorious. He was exactly right. And he had a name written, uh, written that no one knew except himself. So what was, what was the number of the beast? Six, six, six. And John says it's a man's number. It's not God's number. It's a man's number. Here is a name that the Lord wears that nobody can, can knows. Why? Because of his righteousness. Because of his uh, omnipotence. Because of his omniscience. All-knowing, all-powerful. And he was clothed with his robe dipped in blood. And his name is called, what? The Word of God. All right. So, first of all, his robe was dipped in blood. Now, some think, well, this was the blood of the sacrifice that he made. Others say this is the blood of the enemies of, of Christ, of those that would bring destruction. Uh, but the point is that he is victorious, and, and there is bloodshed of, of, that he had to go through. And then, of course, that of the Romans, that uh, their blood. And the, he is the word of God. Now, this word here is logos. Uh, L-O-G-A-S. Logos. O-S. That's right. It is the great word for mirror image. Jesus says, you have, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is a direct image of God. The word here is not a oral word. It's not a spoken word. It is the direct image of God. He is the logos of God. He's called the son of God when he comes to the earth. Um, he is called God, John chapter 1 one, two, and three. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, and the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so here is the Son of God, here is Christ, here is the Messiah. He is called the Word of God. And the armies, and I want you to notice this, and the armies in heaven clothed in the fine linen, 
white and clean, followed him on white horses. So, are these angels? Are these saints? Are these warriors? They are not warriors. They are not people who are fighting war. These are witnesses. That's what these are. They are not fighting the battle which God fights himself. Yes. And look at the next verse. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with it he should strike the nations. He doesn't need an army of angels to follow him to fight the battle for him. He doesn't need that. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with that sharp sword, he destroys the nations, destroys those who are after him. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of God Almighty. God's wrath is poured out upon the wicked, upon those who have persecuted God's people. A couple of chapters earlier, we see the great harlot. She is clothed in what color? Scarlet. She, she's sitting upon the dragon. She is sitting upon uh, the many waters. She is ruling the world, but she is a harlot. And not only a harlot, a mother of harlots. She's not just a harlot, she's the mother of harlots. And so here the, the word of God comes out with a sharp sword and smites the nation and rules them with the, the, an iron rod. When you look at the, in Daniel chapter 2, it talks about the great beast. There's the head of gold that was Babylon. There is the arms and the chest that were silver. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. There's the legs that are brass. That is the Grecian Empire. And then their legs... And the feet, part feet, are iron. Rome was, when Rome went through the country, it, it destroyed everything in its path. And everybody fell into subjection because Rome was greater and more powerful than any other force and any other army. But now here is the word of God whose, whose sword is, comes out of his mouth and he's ruling that nation with the iron rod. An iron rod is something that cannot be broken. But you remember that when the beast was in chapter 2, not only did it have legs and feet of iron, but they were also mixed with what? Clay. So they were weak at the feet. And when the stone that came, comes rolling out of the mountain which is described as the kingdom of God, and it strikes that beast in the legs, what happens? Everything falls and crumbles. All kingdoms of men in the world fall, but the kingdom of God still rules. That's what he's saying here. These Christians are ecstatic because now there is, they are being avenged Rome will not continue. Rome will not continue to persecute, will not continue to burn, destroy, and, and torture Christians. They are fallen. And it's done by the word of God. And he himself, we read that, and he shall tread the winepress of his fierceness and wrath of the God Almighty. Now what's a winepress? You put all these, all these oh, grapes in this big wooden vat and then you take your socks off and your shoes off and you stomp on those grapes till the juice runs out. That's the way God is going to take care of the nations. It's like them going to the wine press and he is stomping the grapes and the juice is flowing out. He is going to get rid of the enemies of Christ. He's going to destroy them and particularly he is talking about Rome. Yes. Yes. Okay. And he's taking a lot. He, he's he, he's removing. Where's Rome today? It doesn't exist. 
Right. I mean, the city of Rome is, and it's, it's pretty. It's got all these statues there. Uh, human words to describe the destruction of what's coming. Like Brother Sewell said, it's a spiritual thing and, and we can't grasp around it because we're not in that particular realm and we will be when we are in heaven. But the point is that here John is trying to relate to us how, uh, how the enemies of Christ will be destroyed. Right. All right. And then verse 16, and he gave, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Where's Domitian? Domitian was the king of the world at this time, but the Lord is the king of all kings. He is king over kings. He, he is lord over lords. He is superior to all. And, and so this is not the other. I think there's another passage in the book of 2 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Christ is called the king of kings and the lord of lords. So the point is this, that here is God's rendering judgment upon the, the wicked, upon uh, the Rome and upon those individuals. And, and after Domitian, there were still other persecutors. You had uh, Marcus Aurelius. He wasn't really as bad, uh, but you had Trajan. Uh, you had a couple of others, Servius, uh, Servius V. Uh, you had a couple of others who were persecutors of the church. Uh, and so it wasn't till Constantine, but there were always constant attacks uh, upon them. All right, and then it says, and then I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of God is great. Here are the vultures. He's calling for the vultures. What's a vulture do? Eats dead flesh. The, the announcement before it ever happens, he is calling for the vultures. Come on, because there's going to be a great feast for you. And it's because of the wickedness of those people. And he says, and that you may eat the flesh of kings. Well, you don't eat the flesh of kings. You bury them in, in coffins. You, you put them in sacred places, as they would call it. You put them in mausoleums. But here he, they're eating the, the flesh of kings, these, uh, these birds, and the uh, flesh of mighty men. Uh, what's a mighty man? A soldier. The flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. Who was it that persecuted God's people? Kings? Army captains? Slaves persecuted God's people. Free people did because they didn't believe. Um, uh, Christians did not bow to Rome. And I saw the beast of the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war with him who sat on the horse and against his army. Now here, here is, remember they've already opened up the Euphrates River. And they're going to come across the Euphrates River. And all the wicked men and all the wicked kingdoms are coming up against God and are coming up against his people. So the announcement is, I want you to notice this, the announcement is that they gather together and they're coming up against God. It is the picture of good and evil. It is the battle of good and evil. It's not the ultimate battle, but it is a battle of good and evil. So they have now gathered up all of these evil people 
But I want you to notice the next verse. Then the beast was captured. Where is the war? Where's the details of the war? The enemies of God have come together, the next verse, and they were captured. There's no contest. There's no fight. These, the armies of the world cannot, cannot come up against God, come up against Christ. And the, 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 the multitude of saints that were following them, that were on white horses, they were just witnesses of this. That's all they were. They were not armed. They were not an army. When you Hollywood Hollywood wants to portray all of this, they've got all of this battle of Armageddon. You got spaceships coming in, or you got these evil coming in, and the world is in desolation, and the New York City is crumbling down, and people are walking through, and there's grass and things growing up all over the place. There ain't gonna be nothing like that. They gather themselves against the armies of God and guess what? Of the army of God and guess what? The next verse is they're taken. <laughs> no contest, no fight. So there, there is no comparison. The beast was captured and with him the false prophet. Now who did we say the beast was? Rome. Who's the false prophet? It is the conciliate. It is the, the uh, ones who ordained or set up these uh, pagan worship places of worship um, where the Christians would have to bow who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who re received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image do you remember that these prophets uh, did great signs and wonders and it wasn't that they did miracles it was a fact that they deceived the nations and deceived the world and they were captured here in, in this. And it says, and these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. What is that? You can say it. Hell fire. Eternal damnation. They were cast in alive. Yes. All right. So we'll have to stop right here. I know y'all got a million questions. Brother Sewell will be glad to answer after class.
Certainly it's good to see everyone here this evening. We have 51, and it's good to see everyone. Um, our song of invitation is 465, and we'll be ready to sing that in just a moment. The first and the last verses. 456, okay. Those numbers are moving on me, so. All right, so anyway, 456. But uh, anyway, it's, it's good to see everyone out this evening and, and as we're here in our midweek Bible class. You know, when we think about the religious world and many people in the religious world certainly have been deceived by others, been deceived by uh, other individuals, uh, certainly people who are sincere often get the wrong information and they certainly cannot um, obey God with the information as they have. Paul said, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he, he says, if we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. If we sow to righteousness, we will reap eternal life. Now that's a paraphrase, but that's the, the point of all of this, that we are in this world will receive the things that we have, have sown in this world. And John talks about the test of a child of God, te the test of a follower of Christ. Many people say, well, there, you know, there's not anything you have to do. All you have to do is just say, I love God, and then you're saved. But the Bible has a different uh, story than that or a different message than that. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning of verse 3, John says, By this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So the point is that we have to keep the commandments of God. In, Re in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so the, the love that we have for Christ is seen in our life, in our action. Then he continues to say this, but, he's, but whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. And he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. In fact, in the first chapter of this same book, John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so we, the, we walk in the gospel. We walk as a life. It is a metaphor as a way of life. As we journey through this world, we're walking in Christ. And then we come to the book of Revelation in chapter 22, verse 14, where it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of of the city. The point is this that it takes our obedience to Christ, obedience to God, to have eternal life. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all those that obey him. And so it requires obedience. It requires us following Christ. Paul says it requires a sacrifice, and not just a sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this, tonight, if you're not a Christian, Become a Christian through the obedience of the gospel. Romans 1.16 says it is the power of God unto salvation. And we obey Christ, believing that Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God, to repent of our sins, confess Christ before others, and then to be baptized for the remission of sins, putting us into Christ, putting us into the Lord's church, to rise up out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. And maybe you've done that, but yet you have turned away from God and turned back into the world. Repent of those sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you need to respond to the gospel, would you come as together we stand and sing? There's a I'd like to welcome everybody to our midweek Bible study tonight. Um, don't see any new visitors, so we'll go straight to our list of sick, those that we need to continue to pray for. Arnold Mungie, Lucille Watkins, Connie Stacy, Juanita Griffin, Colleen Corrado, Danny Mills, Vaughn and Marcelin Underwood, Maria Martin, Bonnie Wright, Audrey Peed, Jerry Griffin, Sherry Dean, Jill Shirley, Sue Wheeler, Rhonda Burnett, Nancy Marshall, Eddie Partain, Francis Turner, Chris Elliott, Aurelia Rogers, Juanita Chanel, Jerry and Della Hill, Geraldine Yeager, Edna Wyatt, Teresa Anderson, Alan Woodall, and Justin Rohde. Also, Amos Dean is recovering from gallbladder surgery, and Alina Smith is still recovering from surgery as well, so remember them as well in your prayers. Also, a general announcement to men, if you will check the list out in the foyer on the bulletin board on this side of the foyer for prayer leaders and people who serve on the table and your participation in the worship service. If you can't do the assignment you're signed up for, please let one of the elders know for we can find someone to replace you. Also, birthdays this week, Sue Cawthorns was on Monday, October the 11th. And we are updating the church bulletin. If you have any information that you need to update that's currently incorrect in the bulletin, please let Joel know for he can get that updated. Directory. Yeah, directory, our bulletin. Also, write it down and give it to Joel. That way he doesn't forget you told him it was wrong. It doesn't get updated. And I believe, if I'm correct, based off the Sunday one, our pantry item is peanut butter this week. If you could pick that up at the store and... Bring it for our pantry. That will be appreciated. And remember, Sunday services, 9 a.m. Bible class, 10 a.m. worship. And we hope to see you there. That's all the announcements. Our closing song is 568. We'll sing the first and the last verse of this song after which Brother Lloyd Pumphrey will lead us in our closing prayer. We invite you to stand as we sing these two verses.
Let's pray together. Father, you bless us in so many different ways, and one of the greatest of those blessings is the ability for us to come together and to study more of thy word, to learn more about what thy will for us is. We're so thankful that here in Fulton we have so many Bible teachers. We ask you to bless each of these who take so much of their time to study and be prepared to be able to teach others. May we take these things that we hear and apply them to our lives and may they help us to be better Christians and better examples for before all whom we come into contact with. We have so many of our number, Lord, who are sick. We have those who are shut in who will perhaps never be able to come back to the worship service. We have those who have lost loved ones. We have those that have, are recovering from surgeries. And we have those who are undergoing treatments at this time. We just pray that you be with all of them, be with those who are responsible for their health, that the things that are done be just the very thing needed to help restore their health back and un unto them, if that be thy will. Go with us, Father, as we leave here tonight. May we uh, always be prepared to give the a right answer of the way we live our life when asked. And we ask if there's any sin that stands between us and thee at this time, as you forgive, forgive us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.